Okay, so, um, so this is the question. It says the accompanying figure shows a cross section of a long hollow cylindrical conductor of some inner radius and outer radius. Um, so I hope uh, as you read the description and look at the figure that you have this image in mind. Let me show it. I happen to have this. So if I had extra time, I would do this demo. So what they're describing is basically something that looks like a pipe. So here's an example of a, well, copper tube. And what the cross section there is showing is a copper tube like this. Um, you're, it's showing you this view. So, <laughs> so with that in mind, uh, what they're saying is uh, there's a 45, there's some amount of current. Uh, let me just call, label this I naught distributed uniformly over the cross section uh, flows into the page. So I have currents that are flowing into the page. I think I want to define a um, new quantity or you know quantity you have seen in textbook, which is the current density, because I can see from the arrangement of this setup that. Um, that for some of these values, oh wait, um, you know I, I don't need a current density. Um, unless, um, let me just double check. I, what I want to double check is if I'm going to get any distance that's in between, depending on randomized um, numbers. So A, B, C, um, let me, uh, I want to, so what I want to do is I want to double check the, okay, I, I think the random numbers are set up such, oh, sorry, I misread the question. <laughs> it says two and five. So I think uh, the way, yeah. I'm pretty sure that's the same deal here. Yeah, so let me label those so that I don't confuse myself. Um, so R1 is four centimeters and R2 is six centimeters. And all these are, so these uh, distances are generated um, so that it will always give you the distances this way. The first distance will be smaller than R1 the second distance will be between R1 and R2, and the third distance will be greater than R3, or not R3, uh, R, greater than R2. That's uh, how it'll always be. And um, so the answer to A and C is fairly simple. Um, so, so let me uh, do this question properly once for B, and that'll be a good starting place to get quick answers to A and C. So let me do it that way. So with that in mind, I think I need to define the, the, the current density. This is a quantity that you have seen in the textbook. Current density is defined so that it's the amount of current considered as a vector quantity divided by the area. That's the current density. Oh, you know, I guess I don't actually have to make this a vector because I'm not going to use the vector sense. I do have to mind if it's into the page or out of the page, but let me just leave that here. So I have the current given. So I need to figure this portion out. So it's the area of this, uh, uh, what is it called, the annulus? I think that's the, the, the 2D geometry. Um, so you know, the area of that the ring is, it's the area of the outer circle minus the area of the inner circle. So A should be uh, pi R2 squared minus pi R1 squared. Or if you want to simplify it a little bit, pi times R2 squared minus R1 squared. So that's going to be the expression for the current density J. Let me write it here for now. And I'm going to be using the letter J for most of this question, 
in fact, um, all of the question, uh, knowing that with the given numbers, you can plug the numbers in here to get the current density in the unit of, I don't know, area per uh, square centimeter. So, so for the rest of the question, I'll use the symbol J because that'll make things a little bit simpler. So, so let me do B first, since the B is the most uh, challenging setup. Once I do B, then the rest is a little bit easier. So, um, maybe, maybe, maybe not so much. Let me start out with a B. So this is an application of Ampere's law question. You are given the current and um, the law that you want to use it has this form, the line integral of B dot DL is given by uh, let me use the, the the coefficient that I prefer. 4 pi times Coulomb constant divided by C squared times the current enclosed. And there are two things that you need to consider in applying this. The first part is this part here, that magnetic field is inside the integral. So you need some clever argument to be able to get the magnetic field out of the integral. And that clever argument is the symmetry argument. You have to think of a symmetry that uh, fits with this setup and, and you have to choose uh, your loop DL that you are integrating over in such a way that the, the dot product of the magnetic field and DL will be constant or it'll be something that you can work out without knowing the exact value of B over the path. So for a cylindrical arrangement like this, um, it has really, it, it has uh, two symmetries that are useful. Uh, one is a, a translational symmetry, as in if you are looking at it from side, as you translate that uh, cylinder, Either way, nothing's real. So, you know, this is not infinite, so you see something changing, but if this were infinitely long, then as I move it, nothing will really be changing. So you have the translational symmetry that, um, and what the translational symmetry gives you is that you can just pick one cross section, like this one, work things out for that one cross section and everything will be fine. You don't have to consider another cross section. And, and it also gives you the rough direction of the magnetic field uh, with that uh, translational symmetry. The only direction your magnetic field can be in that's consistent with the Biot-Savart's law and everything is, um, let me kind of get the direction right. So <laughs> current going into the screen. And so the, uh, the magnetic field should be uh, clockwise. So, so the only, possible directions of magnetic field is kind of cir circular going this way. Um, if, if we didn't have the translational symmetry, then there might be a component of magnetic field that's uh, perpendicular to the screen, but you don't have that. That's not consistent with the translational symmetry and the, and the reflection symmetry. And so that's one symmetry that kind of constrains what direction magnetic field can be. And the other symmetry that will be useful is the rotational symmetry. So, uh, well, rotational symmetry, like rotation this way. Um, so as you imagine rotating this uh, cylinder, kind maybe in this way, you are not really changing anything, which means magnetic field at this point should be the same magnetic field at this point as long as the distance is the same. So the, the geometry for the Amperian loop that will exploit all these existing symmetries is a circle. It's a circle going this way. So when I have an Amperian loop that's chosen specifically to exploit this symmetry, a circle that's a concentric with these um, cross-sectional things, then the magnetic field at all the points will be the same. So with that argument, you can pull the magnetic field out of the integral and you can justify writing down this expression that this is equal to magnetic field times the line integral of DL. 
And I just can overemphasize how important this justification step is because um, this is kind of like magic in the sense that you have to say the right words. And when you don't say the right words, nothing happens. When you say the right words, <laughs> you, you have done this magic proof. So, um, so okay, I've done that step and applied the symmetry, made the symmetry argument and pulled the magnetic field out of the integral. Then this integral here is actually really simple. It's a line integral of DL around the circle. So that's just the circumference of the circle. Um, so I've been pretending that I'm gonna do this integral. I don't end up doing it. I can just do, write down the left-hand side as B times two pi R, good. Now the right-hand side needs a little bit of work for part B, which is why we are doing that first. So let me write down the parts that need to work. It's the part about the current and closed. So, um, so this loop here, it only encloses the current in the region that I'm shading. So as you can see, it doesn't enclose all the current. It only encloses the current in this portion. <laughs> so, um, so I need to figure out how much current is in this portion and I feel most comfortable doing that um, more geometrically than um, geometrically than other more complicated things I could do. Because you know the this is the place where you could get too formalistic. You know, you could say I enclosed that's the surface integral of J D A, you know, current density times the the area element. So you integrate over the annulus thing and uh, and that'll give you current and close. But I think that's a kind of more formalistic method than something that I need. I can kind of stare at this for a while and figure, hmm. All right, so I have this as the area of the cross section. And I can write down an expression for the area that's enclosed within this radius R. So area that's enclosed within the radius R it's gonna be, so the R will become my outer circle, pi R squared minus, I still have to subtract off this inner circle, R1 squared. And I think intuitively what I would say the current enclosed is, is well, take the ratio of the, the total current flowing divided by the area of the cross section, or that's my current density, times the area of the portion of the cross section that I'm enclosing. So that is gonna be my I enclosed. So, so let me write that down. Then, um, then for the right-hand side, what I get is four pi Coulomb constant over C squared times uh, let me write out I naught over A times AR. And uh, let me do a little bit of the remaining algebra. Solving for B here, you get B is equal to four pi KE over C squared times um, I naught over a times two pi r times a r. And this is the place where you could just plug in the numbers. You have enough numbers to just plug in the numbers and finish it out that way. Or you could uh, work this out analytically. And I'll say for this question, I don't have a preference either way. There is a, something you can get out of by writing out the analytical expression. So let me do that. Let me show you what cancels and why it might be semi-useful. Um, pi r2 squared minus r1 squared times two pi r and a r is pi r squared minus r1 squared. And um, the part that is 
could be kind of useful is if you separate out this term, you see that for the first two term, that this R can cancel one factor of R. So there's one term that goes linearly with the uh, radius. So the magnetic field as a function of R, there's a term that goes as linear. That's a kind of a feature you begin to see when you have a, uh, when you have a uniform, uniform things, uniform charge density, uniform current density, and noticing that is worth something. But the thing that's complicating here is that you have this term here too. So it, you don't quite get that simple things. That's why I'm a bit ambivalent towards should you just plug in the numbers or do the algebra, do whichever. Um, by the way, the answer you're plugging in here is a numerical answer anyway. Uh, let me finish up the um, part A and B. Part A is a simple. Um, if your loop is inside the inside the innermost uh, inside the inner radius of the conductor, then you are enclosing zero current. So um, you would get zero um, <laughs> zero as your magnetic field after you've made this symmetry argument. You do have to make the symmetry argument. It's not correct that whenever you enclose a zero current, the magnetic field is necessarily zero. That's not the case. The only thing that's guaranteed is that this integral is zero. And for this setup, you can make a symmetry argument to pull out the magnetic field. And from here, the right-hand side of being zero means magnetic field is zero. So that's simple enough. For part to C, you can, well, imagine a um, loop that's uh, outside both of the conductors. Then you can actually go through the exact same calculation that we did earlier. The one care that you need to take is the different meanings that different radii R take. So this R here, is associated with the, the radius of the path. So this is the R. So I let this be, that's the R that we had before. So I let this be, I'm not gonna change that. But um, this R here, that's the R from here. And that's associated with the outer edge of the current distribution. And that stops at R2. So since that stops at R2, um, this R here, it actually becomes R2, not R. And once you have that, then I hope you see that these two actually uh, cancel out. Oh, and pi's cancel out. And no, this pi cancels out, <laughs> these two cancels out. <laughs> and you are left with the uh, expression that looks like, um, well, magnetic field due to an infinite line of current, 2ke over uh, i naught over c squared times r. That's uh, the same formula as the magnetic field due to an infinite line of current, and that's what you would get for part c. And it get, kind of simplifies that way when you carefully replace the, the quantities that you had in the derivation for part b. So, so this is an Ampere's law application question. Make sure as you are going through this question and you know plugging in the answers that you understand the argument that goes into that. Um, that's the kind of thing that uh, uh, that my goal is to get to in the timed assessment follow-up meeting because um, the proof argument like that it's um, you know, you have to kind of to poke at different places to make sure that you understood all the things that you are supposed to understand. And um, yeah, so, uh, so let me leave that there.